Affairs in partnership with Serbian Radio Chicago and Intelligence today. Very honored to have Dr. Paul Craig Roberts with us today. He has served under the Reagan administration, has been an academic, uh, renowned author, and he is the chairman of the Institute for Political Economy. Dr. Roberts, welcome. Thank you. I'm pleased. Wonderful to, to speak to you on this beautiful morning, and thank you for spending your time with us. Um, I we know your background, which is very extensive. Uh, but wanted to get your take on Ukraine war or the military operation, as the Russians call it, particularly in light of uh, Tucker Carlson and President Putin interview. What was your reaction to it? Uh, well, I had two reactions. Um, uh, one is that it's uh, completely clear that uh, Ukraine is defeated. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, and the other reaction is that uh, Putin uh, still, in my view, has not realized the importance of bringing that conflict to a quick end. He seems to be sitting there uh, letting it sink in into the West that uh, Ukraine has is lost and the war can't continue. Uh, but we see in the West, uh, uh, the Americans talking about uh, sending long range missiles that can be used to strike deep into Russia. And we see European governments uh, uh, pledging to send uh, their supply of American F-16 jet fighters and the NATO Secretary General of Stoltenberg stresses that they can also be used to strike deep inside Russia. Hmm. So my critique of the conflict uh, from the beginning is that it required a very quick and complete victory by the Russians before the West could get involved and expand it and expand it because eventually it will spin out of control. And I would think that missiles and, and American jet aircraft striking deeply into Russia would be uh, an element that would spin <laughs> the conflict out of control. Sure. Uh, but what came clear from the Tucker Carlson interview of President Putin is that Putin doesn't see this threat. And hmm. he is determined that his aggression is limited to the Russian areas in Ukraine that were mistakenly put there by previous Soviet leaders. The Donbass, uh, Crimea, these are traditionally parts of the Russian uh, sure. population and were stuck into Ukraine by Soviet leaders for political and or administrative reasons. And so Putin uh, continues to say the conflict is limited to mm -hmm. those areas. Well, it's not. <laughs> um, he continues to emphasize he's not invaded Ukraine and he hasn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't seem to understand that the West sees us differently and the propaganda that's accepted by all of the Western governments and I think by most of the populations that Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia is an yes. invader. Uh, Russia is going to go further and invade all of Europe. And Russia is going to rebuild the Soviet Empire and so on and so on. And he doesn't seem to comprehend that this propaganda uh, aids and abets a continuation and um, uh, a rise in the conflict. You may, you may remember we were first told all sorts of things would not be given to Ukraine, but they were. Yes. <laughs> and uh, now we're talking about 
even longer range missiles. And now we're talking about the F-16s, which the United States said would never be given to Ukraine. So even though Ukraine has lost the war, um, the Americans apparently don't intend to stop it. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks, oh, it's over. They won't pass the money. Uh, the money hasn't passed because the Republicans are trying to uh, extract in exchange for passing the appropriations that the Biden regime defend the borders of the United States. Sure. Uh, we have uh, massive numbers of people flowing into the country and the latest count uh, these people are coming from 160 countries. Clearly, these are not political refugees. Yes. There is an enormous amount of documented evidence that the, that the non-governmental organizations are recruiting these people and that Washington itself is providing the funds to transport them into the United States to provide them with the money. Fascinating. With... Um, so we do not protect our own border, but oh. we consistently insist on protecting borders of other nations. And even that is selective. For example, going back to Serbia, and I know you have mentioned this many times, we did not pay much attention to the sovereignty of Serbia. We don't pay attention to our own sovereignty, yet we insist on protecting Ukrainian borders or for that matter, Israel's borders. Uh, what is the end game? Because again, even for someone like yourself who is so versed in economic policy, <laughs> is continued funding of war and this kind of selective outrage going to be our ultimately economic demise? <laughs> Well, you know, okay, I'll answer that, I think. Uh, but first of all, you know, um, uh, it's not Ukraine's borders that are being defended. It's Russian borders. Sure. And um, it's not uh, Israel's borders that are being defended. It's the borders of the Palestinians being overrun. <laughs> I mean, in Palestine has been uh, gradually occupied since 1947, a little piece at a time. Mm -hmm. So with Serbia, I don't, I don't know the uh, uh, political and economic reasons uh, that Washington decided to destroy Yugoslavia and then to further diminish Serbia. Um, I usually, when Washington does something like this, it's to gain a compliant government. Yes. And I, I have read reports uh, that I find uh, discouraging that the current president in Serbia is more and more compliant uh, with the West and less and less representative of the fierce independence that has always been associated with Serbia. <laughs> So uh, why are they doing it? I don't know. I've not studied it. I'm, I've observed it. I've remarked on it, but I couldn't give uh, any answer with confidence why they decided to take out Serbia. Um, it is true that uh, the United States uh, military security complex needs enemies and needs wars. Mm -hmm because if it doesn't have an enemy and it doesn't have wars, then the massive trillion and a half, one and a half trillion dollars annually that the military security complex absorbs would have no justification. So there has to be an enemy, there has to be wars, and uh, we have our main enemy is Russia and China and Iran, and then we have smaller enemies like Serbia. <laughs> Well, and Serbs are viewed as little Russians in many of the Western um, minds, I guess, if you will. So maybe that is one of the reasons, historical and otherwise. Historical, uh, the same sort of religious uh, element. Yes. Uh, 
It may well be that uh, Washington picked on Serbia in order to um, take a slap at Russia and to put Russia in its place and to show that Russia couldn't uh, protect its allies, its, its historical allies. Uh, that may have been, it may have been the neoconservatives. Come on, let's poke our fingers in the Russia's eyes. Sure. Well, interesting you say that because I think that was the remark that President Putin made on several occasions. And the latest remark was within the Tucker Carlson interview where he specifically said that when Yeltsin at the time wanted to stand up for Serbia, that was a big uh, breaking point between Russia and, and the West. Serbia was it. It was the culprit that started the disintegration of the relations. Yes, and the neoconservatives certainly intended bad relations between uh, Russia and the United States. Uh, they wanted to be sure there would be no outside support uh, for the Middle Eastern countries that were in the way of greater Israel that they intended to overthrow. You may remember the General Wesley Clark revealing on television, yes. he'd seen the document where seven countries in the Middle East would be overthrown in five years. Well, these are all people uh, supplying a Hezbollah, uh, for example, which stood in the way of uh, Israel's invasion of Lebanon. So the neoconservatives are, are a main element in this. Um, they're mainly uh, Zionists. Uh, they hate Russia. And um, this, this, itself is enough to explain uh, the suffering that Serbia has. Uh, so um, I just saw recently, I believe it was Wall Street Journal, Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence, I think, uh, penned an op-ed, joint op-ed, uh, titled, We Must Strike Iran. And as you pointed out, Wesley Clark did outline um, those plans, and Iran seems to be the last on the list. But a big one. Do you think we will go there? Are we crazy enough to go there? Uh, yes. Yes, we're crazy enough to go there. Israel has been demanding it for years and years. The American neoconservatives control U.S. foreign policy. They're in total control. There are no alternative voice. And uh, they are, are close allies with Netanyahu and the Israeli Zionists. And I think uh, uh, our intent to attack Iran was shown immediately when the uh, Hamas attack on Israel led to the current genocide. Because immediately we saw two U.S. aircraft carrier task force there. Uh, we saw uh, a United States airborne division there. We saw all kinds of American fighter jets relocated there. And all of this had to be in the works because it was there immediately. <laughs> there was, it was already on its way before the attack. So I've been convinced that this attack was known and was intended for the purpose of expanding a conflict between Hamas and Israel into the Middle East because the various... Uh, Various of the Arabs had said that they weren't going to stand for it, but they have. Well, and they have. Yeah. And the fact. Yeah, and that, that was my next question. Do you think this will escalate? Because you look at Turkish pres uh, President Erdogan, you look at Iran, you look at the Saudis, you look at what is happening in, on that geopolitical landscape. Will they react given what they're seeing happening to, to the Palestinians? I don't think uh, that um, they will expand the conflict. It will be done by mm -hmm. the Israelis or the Americans if it expands. See, the only people actually interfering with Israel's uh, attacks on Hamas is um, the Houthis. Yes. And uh, already we have expanded the war into Yemen because uh, we now are attacking the Houthis the United States and the British. So it has expended, and the war has expanded in that sense. 
Now, I think that Putin has convinced the Arabs just to stay quiet, not, mm -hmm. not to give the Americans an excuse. Um, I've, I've been uh, greatly surprised that the Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians have not publicly announced a mutual defense treaty. Uh, Interesting. On one is attack on all, because that would end the whole thing. Uh, if it becomes clear to the Congress and to the American people, the people in Europe, that attacking Iran is identical to attacking Russia and China, they haven't they haven't got the uh, fortitude to take that on. That's hmm. something that would be. Uh, it would mean the end of the existence of the entire West. Uh, the West has, this is my cat. You see my cat? <laughs> it's very jealous of my time. Oh. Uh, he comes to tell me, no, no, you go away now. Uh, so I think that uh, what we all, all of those American forces that are there were not there to fight Hamas. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> and so the neoconservatives were counting on the Iranians actually doing something. They were counting on Hezbollah actually coming across the border into Israel. Um, uh, and they didn't. Hmm. So now they're trying to find how we can have an excuse to expand it. And it's one of the reasons the neoconservatives have sort of dropped their interest in Ukraine, because they see getting rid of Iran as the most important thing, because it is the Iranians who supply Hezbollah with the means to resist the Israeli intrusions into Lebanon. So Iran's the target. Well, it's clear to me that if something happens to Iran, then the CIA is going to be able to run its jihadists straight into the Russian Federation. So you would think they would be up in arms about this. The same thing with China. They'll be able to run it into that troublesome province in China. Yes. They'll be able to run the jihadists into all of, uh, uh, of the former Soviet Central Asia, all of the former uh, Soviet republics. Mm -hmm. It'll be such a nightmare for the Russians, and yet they don't do anything. Now, I did see a report some time ago that uh, Putin uh, said that he and Iran were working out some kind of pact. Uh, but, you know, this is of the utmost immediacy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's, there's no time. You know, like Putin wasted eight years on the Minsk agreement. If he's going to do that again they, <laughs> with Iran, then it's the neoconservatives will find some excuse, even if they have to create another false flag. They're brilliant at false flags. They've gotten away with all of them, including 9-11. So, hmm. yes, I think Iran is the main target of the neoconservatives who control the entirety of Western foreign policy. And so question about just maybe the mentality and the difference in the mentality, because that was clear to me even from the history lesson that President Putin gave, and you served under President Reagan. Um, do you think that the restraint that Russians and the Chinese and maybe Iranians are exercising in our mind we interpret that as weakness, which is why yeah. we keep doing what we're doing. That's right. And are we going to overplay our hand at some point? At some point. You see, as you said, and as I've emphasized, the restraint that comes from Iran and Russia and China, uh, is used by the neoconservatives to say, see, they won't do anything. So we don't have to be restrained. And so the provocations get worse and worse. That's what we've seen throughout the Ukrainian conflict. Sure. The provocations get worse and worse. Um, and yet nothing happens. You know, initially, Putin declared all these red lines. 
And we went across all the red lines. He did not. Yes, we did. So, you know, being cautious and responsible is the mark of a great statesman. And that's exactly what Putin is. But he's he's misjudging. The impact is to cause the West to up the provocations, up them and up them. And at some point, they will be so extreme that it will lead to, it will spiral out of control and it will lead to a nuclear war. And wow. that, that, I think, is what Putin overlooks. Uh, and I think um, the Chinese leader overlooks it. And of course, Iran, Iran is dependent on both of them and can't uh, annoy them or, or go totally against whatever they are cautioning. And so, well, so, but for us, how much longer can we keep this up? Because again, the American people, from what you and I know, probably are absolutely against this. And our political elite is disenfranchised from the American people. They don't represent us. They're doing what they want to do. Um, everybody is against these wars and in economic terms. And, and I stress this consistently, foreign policy and people don't quite connect the two. But foreign policy comes back to haunt us in economic terms, in terms of the prices at your grocery store, at the gas station. How far can we keep this going? And until we here ourselves reach a breaking point economically. Oh, I think uh, the, the American economy has been broken for some time. And uh, the middle class is gradually diminishing. Um, you see, the, the, the trouble is uh, that uh, the government doesn't care what the people want. So it doesn't represent the people. It represents the uh, powerful interest groups that control the government. You know, you can't, if you run for president or the, the Senate or the House, you have to have uh, enormous amounts of money. And this money, yeah. these campaign contributions come from the elite that control the government. So, you know, it's the military security complex. It's uh, it's big pharma, the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it's agribusiness, you see. You know, it's it's energy and mining. It's, it, it's the CIA and the FBI. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of non-governmental organizations that are... They're American, and they're working directly against American interests. Yes. For example, they're funding the immigrant invaders that are overrunning our cities. And, you, you know, we have coming into the country every year, according to official numbers, which many people think are understated, we have immigrant invaders coming into the United States every year, equivalent in number to 12 cities the size of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wow. So in two years, you've got 24 cities the size of Pittsburgh. In three years, 36. So the country is being overrun, and the monies are coming from American non-governmental organizations and from the federal government itself. So one thing we do know is the people are tired of the immigration, but they can't do anything about it. Nothing. Even Can this lead us to internal civil war? I don't think there can be a civil war because the red states aren't contentious. You know, like when the North invaded the South in 1861, the Southern states were a whole. Mm -hmm. They things were spread around. There's no border. Uh, how do you have a civil war too? When uh, you know we we're allowed to have uh, rifles and pistols, but we don't have uh, missiles and rocket propelled grenades and tanks and jet fighters and bio warfare. <laughs> you know, the people aren't allowed these weapons. Only. The guys in Washington have them. Sure. 
So it's kind of hard to have a civil war when, first of all, uh, we know Washington doesn't care about people being slaughtered. I mean, look what's going on in, um, in, in Gaza. And it's our weapons that are doing it. We haven't halted the weapon, the American weapon flow to the Israelis. So we don't care. We, we, we veto every time the UN passes a resolution calling for a ceasefire, we veto it. <laughs> well, so why is calling for peace a controversial statement? It's and anti- maybe this is it, a loaded question. Well, but... if it, in, the, uh, in the Israeli context, it's anti-Semitic to call for peace. It means you're wow. supporting the Palestinian terrorists and that you hate Jews. So, and it's not clear either that all the people are against all the wars. For example, in the United States, we have this phenomena of um, uh, Christian evangelicals. Many of them call themselves Christian Zionists. Yes. They essentially worship Israel, not Jesus. (laughs) Or the United States, for that matter. Well, they, they see the conflict uh, as their uh, escape from uh, sin and evil on earth because they're taught in the final days they're waft up to heaven. And so, um, you know, this conflict is their way to heaven. <laughs> they identify what's going on in, uh, in Israel and Palestine uh, with final days. And so they very much support the Israeli uh, genocide of the Palestinians. Um, They may or may not support the Ukraine. I think on the whole, the people are tired of that war because, you know, initially they were all waving Ukrainian flags. Yes. (laughs) Uh, But the Americans always get taken in. And we got taken in on the Vietnam War, for example. Uh, we got taken in with uh, the Iraq war, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. It was a total lie. Uh, we got taken in, uh, we destroyed uh, Libya. So everybody gets all excited. We're going to get them. And then they find out they've been lied to and deceived again. But they always fall for it. Yes. And we <laughs> keep falling for it. They keep falling for it. So I don't, but it wouldn't matter. Even if they didn't, they have no mechanism by which they can stop it. Hmm. Uh, They're not, they're not prepared to engage in the level of violence against Washington that they would have to engage in to have any impact on Washington's policy. Uh, In my view, uh, the Western, no Western government cares what the people think and no western government represents the people and so so what is the end game for the people for we the people tyranny tyranny and that is what we're facing inevitably well we we we're up to our necks in it already yes and so Peaceful protests are meaningless because the government doesn't care what the people think or say. They, only very large, violent protest could possibly have any effect on the behavior of Western governments. But they don't care. They're basically on the side of the immigrant invaders more than yes. they are their own people. And criminals and... yeah. And and in blues and in, in the democratic control zones, yeah, they're on the side of criminals against the police. Um, so the people, the, the notion that the people have any control over the government because of voting is absurdity. First of all, they only get to vote for people that the elites choose to run. <laughs> And if by chance they get somebody who doesn't represent the elites, like Donald Trump, the elites spend eight years trying to drive the guy into the ground. And the message goes out to all other future political candidates. You represent us, 
or we get you. Hmm. You try to represent the people, we'll destroy you. And that's what the message that's been given to Trump is. It's for all other candidates to see, huh, I got to represent the elite or I'm finished. And, and that was my final question to you. 2024, here we are moving allegedly towards an election. Many say we won't even have it. It will not happen. Um, obviously, President Trump leads. He has beat every single competitor so far in the primaries. Um, are we going to have this election? And what is <laughs> the outcome? Because obviously you said peaceful protests won't do anything. Do we still believe in the democratic process? Can we vote ourselves out of this? You see, it's an impossible situation right now for the Democrats because uh, Biden's, President Biden's own Justice Department recently ruled that he was not mentally competent to stand uh, trial yes. for, for his uh, misuse of national security documents. So the way the Justice Department got Biden off the hook for the same charge they're trying to press against Trump is by declaring him mentally incompetent. So how can he be president? How can he Great run question. around with the nuclear br briefcase if he's not capable of standing trial for a felony that the Justice Department more or less admits he committed? I mean, he's the vice president. He can't declassify documents. His documents were not stored in a secure room in a house where there are Secret Service agents always present. They were scattered all over. They were in the trunk of his car in a garage somewhere. <laughs> so they get him off by saying he's uh, mentally incompetent. So how can they run him? Um, I noticed that when that ruling was made, the first thing Hillary Clinton did was not dispute it. She said, oh, this is a serious matter. In other words, she stuck her knife right in because I think the plan is to move him aside. Uh, Camilla is a totally unattractive candidate as well, has no chance of winning. And so they'll tell Camilla, okay, we're going to move Biden aside. You will become president for a short period. You're going to choose Hillary as the vice president. Wow. And then you're going to resign. Of course, we'll give you a judicial appointment or we'll make you an ambassador or make you a cabinet minister. And then Hillary will be president prior to the election. Oh. Now, she clearly would have a better chance against Trump. And, but if they figure, even with Hillary, they can't get away with stealing the election a third time in a row, they'll use the border issue between Texas and Washington to say <laughs> crisis, a civil war is brewing. And Hillary can always say, national emergency, the election suspended. So I think that is a, a plausible game plan that the Democrats have. Uh, I don't see how they can expect to run Biden. I mean, look at the laughing stock. If we elect a man that his own government says is incompetent. I mean, what kind of, uh, I mean. <laughs> if he is incompetent, who is running our country right now? Well, the, the people that I said, the, the, the military security complex, big pharma, F, the uh, CIA, um, the NGOs, the, the Atlantic Council, the Aspen, mm -hmm. the Aspen Institute, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. These are the people running. Um, there, there was a recent interview 
that Tucker Carlson did with Mike Benz. Yes. Far more important than the interview with Putin. Agree. Because Benz is the leading expert on the censorship industry. And he explained, he named all the groups who actually rule us. <laughs> and I just named some of them. So they're in control. And how do you get them out of control? If a, if a president like Trump, who had amazing support of the people, that's rare. We haven't seen that since Ronald Reagan. Yes, I agree. Uh, a strong, powerful man, strong-willed, a multi-billionaire. If he can't do anything about the ruling elite and they can evict him and bring endless false charges, indict him, put him on trial, you know, he's facing four felony charge trials, four separate trials right now, plus all these civil trials. If they can do that, how many people are there like Trump? <laughs> Where are they? Where are alternative leaders who would stand up to the establishment? They're not here. So I think that, um, you know, democracy is um, a, a sham. It's a sham throughout the West because no Western leader represents the people. Uh, Europe represents first and all, first above all, American economic and foreign policy mm -hmm. interests. That's yes, the first. Then they represent the interests of the immigrant invaders that are overrunning all European countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people are just in the way. In fact, if you notice, uh, the elites have carefully redefined democracy. It no longer has anything whatsoever to do with the will of the people. Democracy has to do with, quote, the sanctity of democratic institutions. <laughs> what are these institutions? The institutions of the elites. The NGOs, the Atlantic Council, the military security complex. You see what I'm saying? They have to yes. find themselves as the democratic institutions and their sanctity, the protection of their sanctity requires that you censor all criticism. They, can, they demand to control all explanations, all narratives. We, we, we see this everywhere. We saw it when Elon Musk released the Twitter files. Mm -hmm. What did the Twitter files show? It showed the United States government was using Twitter to control explanations. We saw, we saw it also when it came out that the Bezos at Amazon was censoring books that the United States government demanded be censored. Well, you see it everywhere. You, of course, the American uh, prostitute media, the TV and, and print media, they're obviously propaganda ministries for the official narratives. That's all. You don't get any truth out of CNN or NPR, or the New York Times, or, or any of that. No. You get uh, the official line as laid down for them. So people can't even get information. And, and now they're turning on what remains of the alternative media online. Because having redefined democracy as the sanctity of their own control in institutions, they can shut down the rest, rest of us because we are a threat to the sanctity of democratic institutions. So I think that's what we're gonna see this year. I also saw recently that the United States is now funding in Wuhan, China, uh, the weaponization of bird flu. And so here I we go be, again. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to see bird flu released in 2025. And by then, we will have the uh, World Health Organization in control of everyone's medical policy. 
and you will have to be vaccinated or you will be imprisoned. I don't know if you saw, but a week or two ago, the French government passed a law. Yes. That if you refuse uh, the recommended medical treatment, uh, you get a three-year prison sentence and a 45,000 euro fine. And that if you criticize the uh, COVID vaccines or any, vaccine, but you also get a three-year prison sentence. So now we have the distinguished independent scientists who have the evidence that the vaccine does extraordinary harm and causes death. Mm -hmm. If they publish those results, they have committed a felony and are sentenced to three years in jail. So you can no longer speak medical truth if it goes against the interest of big pharma in France. And oh. when the, in, in May of this year, governments who did not opt out of the World Economic uh, uh, Health Organization. World Health Organization. World Health Organization. If you didn't opt out, you are now subject to their control over your health policy. So there won't be any uh, evading. No one will be able to evade <laughs> the next vaccine because the prison rule will be uh, if you're in prison, you have to be vaccinated. And so you're going to get vaccinated whether you refuse it and go to prison or don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who is going to vaccinate all of these hordes of migrants that we are seeing in the United States and in Europe as well? I don't. I don't think yeah. they care about that. Um, it's it's the white ethnicities that created the countries named after them: Germany, England, Italy, the Italians, the yes. Dutch. In, in the Netherlands, the French, it, these are the targets. It is the white ethnicities that are the targets. Just like Serbia is a target, not the Muslims in Kosovo. No. It's the, it's the Christian Serbians who are the target of the West. And the West is on one hand, he teaches that the Islamists are terrorists. On the other hand, it supports the Islamists in Kosovo. <laughs> and in Bosnia. Yes, it does. And, yeah. And 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 so uh, the, all of these uh, inconsistencies, if there was a media, someone would point it out. Uh, people would complain. There would be pressure on the government. There's no one to put pressure on the government. Who put, except... Uh, Trump and Tucker Carlson. <laughs> and you see, they didn't want Tucker Carlson to be allowed to come back to America. Yes. You remember that? It was uh, many threats against him still. Yeah, it, it was not only the neoconservatives like this Bill Crystal fellow who said we, we can't let him back in. <laughs> in general, the media and and all of the <laughs> silly people who are patriotic and get easily riled up. Oh, he's a traitor to America. Because why? Because he he interviewed the president of Russia. Well, that's a service. <laughs> we it see, is a service. And that is journalistic service. bravery and integrity, which we lack. But why does it take bravery to do it? <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, very true. I can't remember the Cold War. Somebody wanted to interview a Soviet leader. Nobody thought it took bravery. Yeah. Well, and during that time, we actually had other thinkers who were actively and proactively engaging the Soviets and speaking out. And uh, I mean, I remember even moving here in the 1990s, we had a very robust debate. Since then, that has all disappeared, unless you hear some of the alternative media, as you said. Uh, so you are right. Democracy is dying in the darkness. Uh, I, th I think it's dead. It has no effect. <laughs> it has no effect. Look, uh, you're not allowed to say it, but it's 
it's completely clear that the re-election was stolen from Trump. It's completely clear. Um, he got more votes on his re-election than he did when he yes. first elected. And Biden somehow, despite not campaigning because it was an embarrassment because no one attended when he came to give a campaign speech, there would be no one present. He didn't campaign at all. And despite that, he not only got more votes than Trump, he got more votes than any president in American history. Many more than Obama, many more than Hillary. Well, this makes no sense. It's, Fascinating, isn't it? It's, it's impossible. And, and you knew they stole it because immediately, the minute it was stolen, the message was uniform everywhere in the print and TV media. There was no stolen election. There was no stolen election. There was no stolen election. There was, it was, and yet all kinds of experts were showing all of the evidence, how the machines were hacked, uh, how the vote counts were stopped in the middle of the night with uh, Trump far ahead. And then all of a sudden in the next morning, Biden's far ahead. Yes. I mean, it, 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 all of the uh, faked ballots dropped in drop boxes, all of the ballots with no return address that were counted. I mean, it's endless. It's endless. Um, so if they can steal an election, what is on a presidential level? And they stole the last congressional election. Yes. They stole the, the governorship from that woman in- uh, In Arizona. Arizona. Harry yeah. Lake. Harry Lake. Um, but it you can't say they stole it. I mean, a lot of people are on, uh, have been uh, indicted for simply saying the election was stolen. Well, this, well, so, this is Stalinist type. Yes, law. it is. And is there a positive note to end this on or darkness indeed is going to prevail? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Satan has been released and evil has got the West in its grasp. I don't, where isn't there evil? You know, like in, in the state of Indiana, uh, a Catholic family uh, wouldn't use the pronouns the child had been indoctrinated at school to choose. Mm -hmm. So Child Protective Service comes in, steals the child, and turns it over to a transgender uh, foster home. So if you have no authority over your own children <laughs> what is that isn't that tyranny absolutely so and these examples are endless they're endless you have to pay taxes so your kids go to school if they're white uh, and they learn they're racist and that you're racist they learn they are racist they are transgender communist <laughs> and, they're, and, and they're and they're taught that they they can be born into the wrong body and so now we have clinics all over and they cut off the breast of young girls and they chemically castrate the boys. And, and all of this is said to be some kind of great moral improvement. <laughs> Sick. So, Sick society. I mean, it's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, it is. And there is no end in sight. There's no end, there's apparently no end in sight. So the question is, what happens if Trump's actually elected? How does he govern? Who does he appoint? There's nobody in Washington he can trust. <laughs> I hope he learned that. I, I truly hope he has realized that yes, well, through his first term. He says he's learned that. There are people who are very loyal to him, but they're outside of the belt. Yeah, but they have no experience of what they're up against. Uh, they don't comprehend the totality of the evil. Moreover, 
how would he get them uh, appointed? You know, you have to you have to pass confirmation by the Senate. True. So even assistant secretaries of the have to be confirmed by the Senate because they're presidential appointments. So his whole government has to be confirmed by vote in the Senate on each person. Well, the elite ruling are not going to let the Senate confirm people who are going to help Trump overthrow them. <laughs> Very you true. See what I'm saying? Yes. That even if he can find the people, I don't think they exist. Who wants to go up against that kind of power? Look what it already did to Trump. They're not Trump. They ain't got billions. Yes. If they can uh, do that to him, what can they do to the little guy? Anything. Or, or to people who aren't little, but just not that big. Yeah. And... Uh, and, then, and there are plenty of examples that we've seen even in this previous administration with General Flynn and others. Uh, they've put them yeah. through the ringer. Yeah, they got rid of General Flynn immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so he knew where the bodies were buried. And and he was like the only guy Trump appointed who might have helped him. <laughs> yes. And then finally, uh, they can simply. Kill him, assassinate him. That is the fear that I have, and I've spoken about that. Do you really think that we can get there? And I've heard that I there are fears I even within think, the family. I, I don't think the elite will allow Trump to be president. At any cost? At any cost. I don't. I don't think. And they don't seem, they don't seem to be uh, worried. You would think there is right, no consequences. You would think right now they would be scared out of their boots. No, because, because the Democrats Who will come for them. The Democrats has no have no candidate, and they're taking their time about uh, sticking Hillary in. You know, it's uh, March in a few days. Yes, so March, April, May. I've heard April, Michelle March. Obama on many occasions, but this is a very interesting. Um, no. No. I'd have it. How would that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I think, uh, I think that is a fairly accurate picture I've given you of how serious the situation is. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, other than the fact that the American people have no voice, uh, that they can't do anything about it is many of them just can't accept it. They can't accept that their great and wonderful country is so exceptional and indispensable and so good and done so much good in the world and saved the world from Hitler and communism and, and Mao and, and Castro. And <laughs> they, they can't believe this great and wonderful country would do anything bad. And so when you tell them what's going on, they think you're a commie. You're conducting propaganda against their beloved country. There's so many of them like that. You know, a lot of groups have come and asked me to come speak. And I say, no, what for? If I tell them, they're going to shout me down. Yeah, They can't accept it. They can't believe that this could be happening in their beloved America. They wave the flag. They're wrapped in the flag. So that's why the enemy is Russia and China and Iran. But in fact, the enemy is right here on our own doorstep. That's right. Russia and China and Iran haven't done a damn thing to us, <laughs> except refuse to follow our orders. <laughs> That's a big one. Right? I mean, that's all governments that refuse to comply with us are enemies. And the lesser ones we overthrow or assassinate the popular leader. Uh, and that could potentially be now that we, as you mentioned, Mike Bentz spoke about this, we have turned 
what we learned to do outside, like the regime change, colored revolution tactics, we have turned all of our agencies inward and are targeting not only the American people, but the duly elected president. That's exactly it. Fascinating That's conversation. Yes, well, thank you for the opportunity. You certainly provoked it. <laughs> thank you. And we are going to speak again. Very pleased that we did this today. And thanks again for being with us.